what's going on my adult series. So uh, today, if you're watching this after the fact, uh, we're going over basically everything in Unit 5 that isn't the Phillips curve. Unit 5 is, from a structure standpoint, one of the more confusing units in AP Economics because it's kind of like a grab bag of random stuff and the Phillips curve. Uh, so I'm just going to list everything that I'm going to cover in this video and just hope that covers it. Uh, monetary and fiscal policy combinations. What happens if you do both? Uh, I'm going to cover government's debt and deficit spending and like what a government budget surplus is. Uh, I'm going to cover crowding out. That's probably like the trickiest thing in here, at least one of the things that they ask about the most frequently would be crowding out. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, economic growth and policies that are geared towards economic growth as well as monetary growth and the quantity theory of money. That's a whole bunch of stuff. It's a whole bunch of kind of small things to add up to equal when combined with the Phillips curve, unit five. It isn't cohesive. It's kind of all over the place. So today's review is gonna be super fun and it's gonna flow absolutely fantastic and it's gonna make a lot of sense. Absolutely don't worry about it. Give me one second, I wanna pull up the video on my end and I, for some reason, it seems like they don't want me to be able to log into my account on YouTube right now. Looks like I have a viewer, so that's a good sign, but let me just pull it up on my end and everything should be good. We'll get started here at 4.30. It is 4.27 on my clock, so shouldn't be that big of a deal. Okay, there it is. Okay, cool. Audio looks good. Everything seems fine on my end. All right, let me move my mic a little bit closer to me. That should be helpful. Got the whiteboard, got the markers. Got the dog. Archer is always right, right behind me. Hey, bud. Yeah, yeah, man. Oh my God, so much hair. Oh boy. Okay, he's gonna be gross to deal with because of all the shedding. So that'll be fun. Yes, I will try and give you a haircut before the AP exam. That way we can not have kids die from allergies. Uh, oh, what's important stuff to mention, things that are important to mention. Oh, okay, we are getting close now to the AP exams. They are coming around the corner. You've got next week, and then congratulations, AP exams are here after that. So the AP Gov exam, again, that's May 3rd. That is pretty close, like a little less than a week and a half away now. Uh, the AP Econ exam, again, at least just moved to a different position, is May 10th. So he's getting, again, so I said he, so the exam is getting even closer. We are getting there. It is going to happen. Oh, see, look at this. Look at, look at, look at what I got to deal with here. I didn't grab anything. I just pet him and this came off. Gross. Gross, Arch. Okay. Um, yes, if you're looking at my arms are right now, he is like right below the desk, annoyingly. Go somewhere else. Go on the couch so they can see you. You're right out of frame. Okay, um, trying to think of anything else that's worth mentioning from an announcement standpoint for you guys to be aware of. AP exams are coming. They'll be here soon. Prepare. If you're watching this video, yeah, good job. Do some stuff for AP Gov, probably also a good idea. <laughs> also for your other AP classes. Econ's kind of tricky. Lots of stuff you can forget <laughs> relatively easily. But, you know, you're putting the work into my class. Try to put, put as much work as you can into a bunch of classes. It's super helpful. If you're watching this video, though, you're already on a good start. If you're watching it live, fantastic. If you're watching it after, also good. As a reminder, when you're going through this video, if there are things you don't understand that I say, because I, when I talk really fast, that's always a thing. And if it just doesn't click for you, put it in the comments. I'll see if I can respond. Otherwise, feel free to check out other people on YouTube. There's a bunch of good YouTube people out there for AP Economics. The one I recommend the most often is ACDC Economics, like the band ACDC. Uh, that guy, Jacob Clifford, he's got a bunch of really good videos. They're really short and his editing is pretty good. Recommend those plenty. All right. Looking at 4.30 on my clock. Yes, I can do my stuff now. Okay. Let me pause that to save my internet some stuff. Here is everything. That is everything I'm getting today, but I'll, it'll be a little bit longer than that. Nice thing is, no graph stuff today. Well, actually, that's not true. No new graph today. Crowding out is built into the Lumble Funds market graph. I was like, oh, there's no graph stuff. Oh, wait, no crowding out. Sorry. Whoops. My fault. My fault. All right. So first things first, let me start at the beginning so that this kind of, tr I try to structure this so it can flow in a way that makes sense. Let's start very beginning. The government is in a hilarious amount of debt. All right, let's clear this up. So reviewing the government debt and deficit stuff, there's a couple of things to be keeping track of. One, the difference between the debt and the deficit. 
the debt is the total accumulation of all of our debts and surpluses. So, like, if you said, like, 20, 15, we had a surplus, and this is made up of 2 trillion. Uh, in 2016, we have a deficit of 1 trillion. In 2017, we have a deficit of 4 trillion. Then our overall total government debt would be, well, plus 2, minus 1, minus 4, minus 3. We'd be in a debt of $3 trillion. So the government debt is one that happens when you add up all of the surpluses and all of the deficits. A deficit is in a certain year, and this is always a good thing to like mark down in writing somewhere. If your government spending exceeds your tax revenue, uh, that's like the best I've ever done letters on this. Yeah, that's more like this is more like it. <laughs> you are in a deficit if government spending exceeds tax revenue. The logic being if the government tries to spend more than it brings in in taxes, the government's going to have to do a thing. And that thing is acquire some debt. How so? How do you get debt? Borrowing. They're going to borrow a crazy amount of money. Like if they sign off on $5 trillion of government spending and they only end up bringing in $4 trillion in tax revenue, then they're going to have to borrow a trillion dollars from somewhere. Whether that's borrowing from banks, whether that's borrowing from people, whether they issue bonds or something like that, they're going to have to borrow money in some capacity, meaning they're adding to the debt. It's classic stuff there. So they're borrowing money. That's how they pay for things. Now, this gets into a very important concept when it comes to like fiscal policy of thinking about, okay, well, is this bad? Uh, yeah, I mean, at least it's, it's better. It'd be better if we could pay for things straight up. Like that would be better. So there is definitely a bad thing, but what is the downside? And this is the thing that people, like, especially adults, like, have a hard time really explaining. Like you can just grab a random person on the street and be like, hey, why is the government's debt a big deal? And they'll be like, it's bad. It's like, here's why it's bad. It has to do with what's called crowding out. Eh, next thing on the thing. So crowding out refers to effectively the impact of deficit spending. And the impact of deficit spending is that whenever you engage in deficit spending, you are going to create some economic problems that are most likely going to negatively impact fiscal policy. The stuff the government's trying to do to help the economy might not help it as much. So when off, oftentimes when you look up the definition of uh, crowding out, you feel like sometimes there's unintended consequences that like weaken fiscal policy. Crowding out's referring to a really specific uh, problem, which is tied to our loanable funds market. So I'm just drawing loanable funds market because this is the graph where crowding out shows up visually the most. So let's say, let's go hypothetical here because this will help us explain what the problem is with crowding out, that your economy is in a recession, like ours is right now, right? Like the US economy presently, we're still in the pandemic if you're watching this video five years from now, which is terrifying that you would do that, but whatever. If you're still watching this later on, we were in the pandemic whenever I was recording this video, so we were in a pretty bad economic recession. Meaning, the government has a specific thing it should be doing, from like a policy standpoint. So I was asking, hey, what should the government do when you're in a recession? Well, the government should do what's called expansionary policy. And if we're sticking with the government, it's fiscal policy we're talking about. So let's say they do that. Say the government does expansionary policy. We're doing expansionary policy. There are a couple of examples of that that we can say. They could increase government spending or decrease taxes. Let's say they increase government spending, but either would work here. I just mentioned with the deficit thing, if they're increasing government spending and not covering for it with tax revenue, which to be clear here, covering it with tax revenue would kind of hurt it, right? You're trying to spend more and trying to get more spending to happen. If you raise taxes, you're kind of undoing the benefit you're getting. So they probably would be increasing government spending and not changing taxes like they've done this year with all the stimulus bills. Okay, the last two stimulus bills both were like in the one to two trillion dollar range in terms of spending happening. And there was no tax increase to pay for those things. So what's the government really doing? If they increase spending when they're in a deficit, it's called deficit spending. It's a phrase to get used to. It's what happens every year for us. The government will have to borrow to finance that spending. 
Hello, loanable funds market graph. Hello, government might need, might need to borrow some money. Well, if the government's borrowing more, that's going to affect my loan graph. Because this is the market for loanable money and the government is borrowing money. That's tied to it. The demand for loans is built around how much people want to borrow. Government's made of people, y'all. They count just the same. So if they're borrowing more, then that would lead to a higher demand for loans. Which you're like, okay, yeah, the government has to borrow more money. That makes sense. They want to borrow more, so higher demand for loans. Sure. Look at what happened to the interest rate, though. We have got a higher real interest rate than before. Uh, wait a minute. That's that doesn't sound good. Real interest rate going up within our borders is kind of bad for American consumers, right? Because if interest rates go up, then loans get more expensive. Yes, <laughs> this is the problem. When interest rates go up, that leads to a decrease in our investment spending. Remember, that's spending that is built around borrowing. Like whenever you want to go buy a car or house, investment spending. Whenever a business wants to build a new factory, investment spending. Because they're going to have to get a loan to do it. So loans get more expensive. You can't spend as much. This is crowding out. The government is crowding you out of the market for loanable funds. They are taking away money that could have been given to you. They're making it harder for you to get a loan. They're effectively blocking off a chunk of this market. Like this increase in demand is not you demanding more, it's the government demanding more. But since they're borrowing from the same place you borrow from, uh-oh, that's gonna make the amount of money banks have to give out to you not as much. They're gonna be charging more for those loans now. Oh, so now I can't spend as much. This is why the government being in a deficit hurts you like this is how it hurts is that when the government has to borrow more they make interest rates higher which makes investment spending and spending like on a buying a car buying a house harder to do which means remember the idea was that we were in a recession and the government's doing expansionary policy the whole freaking goal of expansionary policy is to increase ad you want aggregate demand to go up if i'm imagining an aggregate demand supply graph in a recession, I am trying to get AD to move to the right to close that recessionary gap, to close that negative output gap, I'm trying to fix it. But if investment spending goes down, that decreases AD. Uh oh. So, wait, then what happens? Does this fiscal policy solve this problem? I don't know now. That's the tricky part is that I couldn't tell you if it does. It should have if there wasn't crowding out, but since there is crowding out, which is gonna start to hurt our spending from a me and you standpoint, but the government spending more might not actually help us the way we think. It's the danger of the stimulus checks. That's why the Federal Reserve is doing everything in their power to keep interest rates low. Remember, the Federal Reserve is separate but they're the ones that are trying to regulate the interest rates and keep them as low as possible during this time period. So they've got to kind of counteract the government here. And that gets you to the monetary and fiscal policy stuff in this unit. That in this unit, they ask about doing monetary and fiscal policy, which at this point in the class, you should already know a lot about, like expansionary policies, increased spending, contractionary policies, decreased spending. Monetary policies like reserve requirement, Federal Reserve buying and selling bonds, discount rate, those things change the money supply and then change interest rates. But here is a key difference. This was an expansionary fiscal policy. It caused an increase in my real interest rate. An expansionary monetary policy, again, that increases the money supply, gets you a lower interest rate. That means there is a significant difference between doing an expansionary monetary and expansionary fiscal policy. There is like, there's a list of like small differences where it's like one's done by the government, one's done by the Fed, one of them involves government spending and taxes, one of them involves like the reserve requirement and stuff. Like there's a list of things that are differences. In terms of like economic impact though, there is a huge difference, which is that doing an expansionary policy when you're in a deficit, which we are kind of all the time, gets you higher interest rates. Doing an expansionary monetary policy gets you lower interest rates. So if you're imagining what's happening in our economy in the real world right now, like what's happening with 
the U.S.'s economy in this pandemic is we're doing a bunch of stimulus bills, which should be giving us a higher real interest rate because of crowding out because the government is doing this and does have to borrow to finance its spending. So we are going to experience quite a bit of crowding out. So a lot of higher interest rates. But simultaneously, the Federal Reserve is also pushing that expansionary button. They lowered the reserve requirement to 0% last week. They've lowered the discount rates down to as little as they've ever loaned it, lowered it down, and they've been buying bonds left and right the whole dang time. So they're doing as much expansionary policies as possible because those expansionary policies should be dropping the interest rate. So they're trying to counteract this interest rate problem to nullify or make negligible the issue of crowding out during this recession. It's not helping the interest rate as much as they'd like it to, but it's helping keep the interest rates from spiking up when they kind of could. So the monetary and fiscal policy stuff, one, you should know the difference between those two is like who does them, and there's examples of both. But in this unit, the big difference is how interest rates are connected to it. Expansionary and monetary gets you lower interest rates because think money supply graph. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna draw it on that. I'll draw it on my board. Like your money market graph an expansionary monetary policy increases the money supply. Like that. Which gets you that lower nominal interest rate. And crowding out, which is caused by fiscal policy, gets you a higher interest rate. Oh, so like doing an expansionary monetary policy, at least like theoretically, should be better because it doesn't carry the risk of crowding out which is accurate. Monetary policy tends to be a more reliable thing for us because it carries fewer risks. It's also less noticeable for a lot of people. Like when there's a big change in government spending, like a stimulus package, it's pretty noticeable because I got a $1,400 deposit in my bank account from the government. I noticed that. That was very easy to see of like, oh, wait a minute. Oh my God, that came from the government. Like that was very easy to see. When the Federal Reserve's lowering interest rates, unless I'm taking out a loan, I'm not noticing that. And right now I'm paying back my student loans and I've noticed that they've paused that. But unless you're borrowing again, like if I were to go buy a car right now, which I'm thinking about because the interest rates are pretty low, I wouldn't necessarily notice the interest rate thing. And this is why knowing the macroeconomic stuff is helpful because knowing that when you're in a recession, you tend to get fairly low interest rates because of all of the expansionary monetary policies the Fed is pumping out tells you, oh, hey, I know that like I still have a job during this recession. Would now be a good time to go buy a car? It's like, actually kind of is. If you're going to go buy a new car, which generally speaking is a bad idea because you lose lots of money on value very quickly. If you were going to go do that, your car loan should be getting pretty right now like a new car loan should be pretty affordable right now okay that's the first three things bang 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 real fast last thing here in unit five the last like again this is random stuff it's a really random unit is the growth stuff so in unit five they also touched on which is a thing that we really haven't touched on yet the concept of economic growth the idea that hey what if just you know spitballs crazy thing to ask what if I wanted my economy to do better, not just now, but like forever, which yes, you should want that kind of all the time. What if I wanted economic growth, which is an overall increase in productivity in the long term, not just short term, but like forever. What does that mean? What is that like? How do we cause that? Now, productivity comes down to visually graph wise for us. If we're increasing our long term productivity, that means effectively that our best case scenario level of production, our maximum level of output is higher. Simple way to show it, which I showed in my class last week, is you take a PPC, you shift it out. That is like economic growth happening because your max level of production is now higher. If you're thinking the graphs that we've covered recently, the aggregate demand aggregate supply graph can be used to show it and the way you would show it there is with your long run aggregate supply curve. Although technically you're using all the lines to do this. That if I am at full employment right now, which this is a little off kilter, which is going to bother the hell out of me, but whatever. If I'm on my aggregate demand supply graph and I am at full employment, the issue that always comes up with our like 
how do we get our economy to grow with a scrap standpoint is the question, what happens in the long run, right? Because for our graph stuff, what we would always do is we would shift a line and then eventually in the long run, you would move back because either the government's gonna try and do a thing to move you back or in the long run, the long run self-adjustment happens and SRAS moves to get you back. But you're always getting back to LRAS. So no matter what increases I had in GDP, in the long run, those would be kind of canceled out. But what happens if I move the vertical line to the right? Mm -hmm. But Mr. McRitchie, we never move the vertical line. You said specifically you won't ever have to draw the vertical line moving. I'm not lying. They won't make you draw it. But what you should understand is that this is what is happening when economic growth occurs. That my aggregate supply in the long run is moving. My maximum, again, that's what the LRS really represents, is my maximum level of production is moving. And also, so is the rest of it. That moving this entire shape over to the right is telling me my max level of production is higher, my current level of production is higher, everything's doing better. My GDP is higher, but my price level is the same. This is the best thing that can happen. You won't ever have to draw that whole dang thing moving because that's confusing as hell. I haven't even labeled equilibriums or all my line stuff yet. That looks like it's gonna, that looks like garbage. You won't ever have to draw that. But you should be aware that the way you would show economic growth on this graph is to shift LRAS and then everything else as well which means the ways to cause economic growth is to do things that would cause your long run aggregate supply curve to increase. Handful of things can do that. The big ones to be aware of, the ones that are the most like used AP exam wise are changes to capital stock and long-term changes to investment spending. So capital stock is the total amount of capital in our economy. It's every machine, every bit of skill your workers have, all of the stuff that helps us make things. So both physical and human capital, all tech, all of your workers' knowledge and expertise, all that stuff is capital stock. So if you improve any of that, if you massively improve your workers' education level, that'll help long-term productivity, not just short-term, but mostly long-term. If you, oh my God, Archer, please stop attacking me right now. I'm just wanting to get attention. Uh, if you improve productivity, yes. If you improve, uh, Frankly, like population kind of works for this. Like if you have a lot more people in your economy, then yeah, you should have a higher like full employment level of output. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean your economy is doing better if you have just more people because per capita matters. But from a graph standpoint, yes, that would be LRS because uh, your full employment would be a higher total number of people. And if you improve technology, like you got much better software or hardware for all of your machines, then yeah, you're gonna be able to make more stuff across the board. Yeah, being able to boot up your computer faster, straight up, straight up lets you produce more as a business. So all that stuff would improve LRAS. All that stuff would cause economic growth, which is great. It's the goal, and the government can try and do things to encourage this as well. The government can pass policies that allow businesses to produce more, right? Like deregulating businesses, that can allow them to make more. That's good for long term supply. The government can can allow for more immigration if you wanted to just increase population remove some uh, limiters on immigration, that would do it. That would be an option. Uh, the government has done things like the GI Bill and the Hazelwood Act that allows for military members and their children to attend college for free. That's improving your nation's human capital. You can improve technology by investing in things like NASA or allowing for a company like SpaceX to do stuff. Like that's all stuff the government can do that will allow for more economic growth. So there is a policy component to it. It's just not like as obvious like increase government spending, decrease taxes. It's like increase government spending on parts of the government that allow for more economic growth, like education, uh, research and development into technology and stuff like that. Yeah, that would work. Okay, and then the last thing with growth, monetary growth and what's called the quantity theory of money. Now these are linked together, but they both come down to what is effectively the same idea, which has to do with this long run self adjustment business. The idea that, hey, we do that expansionary monetary policy thing that I was talking about back when we were talking about crowding out, the like better thing, right? We lower interest rates, we get more people to borrow and spend, that's awesome. We get aggregate demand to go up in the short run, right? More borrowing, more spending, hell yeah, gotta love it, super chill, let's do it. Increase AD. But, but if, if, if 
we as, as we do that, and then we ask ourselves the follow-up question: What happens in the long run? Uh, what happens in the long run on the graph? If the economy is self-correcting, if if what we know about economics or what we believe about economics is true, if the economy is self-correcting, then SRAS should just decrease and get me back to full employment. Which you're like, yeah, my crazy, that's what's been happening. It's like, okay, but if that's happening, think about why that matters. That means that we expanded the money supply. We did an expansion of monetary policy, and all we got out of it was inflation in the long run. We increased the money supply, all we got out of it was inflation. That means, and this is tied into what the quantity theory of money is built around, that whenever you increase the money supply, when you're at full employment, see, like we started there, we're at full employment, whenever you increase the money supply when at full employment, in the long run, you're not gonna get any change to output. Because of the self-correction, you're not gonna get an actual change in my GDP because I start there, I end there. Wherever I start, it doesn't matter. I always end up wherever LRAS is at. So if I do this, if I increase the money supply, I don't get any change to output. In fact, I only get a change in price level. That's all I get. In this case, I get inflation because I increase the money supply. The basic idea is, I was at, oh, Archer's complaining, so he wants to play fetch. Let me see if you guys can see him on camera whenever he catches his phone and he flings himself at the uh, couch. Wah! Nice, you did catch that, good. You didn't catch it, but you got to see it. He's gonna do that for the next 25 minutes until I move it and put the bone up, so I'm gonna have to do that here in a second. But for the mon monetary idea is that whenever you're increasing the money supply, when at full employment, you're basically at your productive, productive limit. You're at your like max capacity. So pumping more money out into the economy isn't really beneficial to you there. You're already at your limit. You're putting more money out there, which is just making that money less valuable. So increasing the money supply when at full employment isn't like that good. It mostly just causes inflation. It doesn't really help your GDP long term. You get a short term increase in GDP. That's what that increase in aggregate demand is. But long term, all it's going to do is cause prices to go up. It's not super helpful. That's monetary growth. And the last thing, one of the weirdest things in the unit, to be fair, the quantity theory of money, which that statement is proven by the quantity theory of money. The quantity theory of money states that the total amount of money circulating in our economy is equal to the total dollar value of all goods and services produced within our economy. Total amount of money circulation equal to the total dollar value of all goods and services produced in our economy. That second thing is just nominal GDP. So they're saying that the total amount of money in circulation is equal to our nominal GDP. There is exactly enough money in our economy to buy all the things from our economy, which kind of makes sense from like a circular flow model standpoint of all of our spending is all of our income, so we couldn't have the money to spend if it wasn't capable of being spent on things. Like, that is kind of what's happening. But it boils down to a formula because, of course, it does because economics hates you, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but the quantity theory of money is built around what's called the equation of exchange, which is M times V equals P times y, although you might see this as pq, that also shows up depending on who is the person who teaches you it. m times v equals p times y. m is the money supply, like m1, like cash money and money in uh, bank accounts, that should be the thing you're not familiar, you're familiar with. v is the velocity of money, also referred to sometimes as income velocity. It is how money, how quickly you exchange your money, how quickly you get a dollar and then you go and go buy something with it, how fast you spend it. Because the faster you spend it, the more spending is technically happening in a given period of time. P is price level, average price of stuff, got it. Capital Y is real GDP. Ah, okay. So what I've got here is the idea that if I take the money supply and multiply it by how quickly you spend it, that is the money in circulation part of the statement, it'll equal the price level times the real GDP, which to be clear, PY is nominal GDP. If you take the price level and multiply it by real GDP, you actually get nominal because effectively real GDP takes out the inflation or adjusts it for the inflation. When you multiply it by the price level, you're adding the inflation back in. So you get nominal GDP. This is again, just the statement of the total amount of money in circulation is equal to the total dollar value of all goods and services produced within your economy in a year. So your money supply times your velocity of money equals your nominal GDP. 
again, I'm going to reiterate that monetary theory thing using this as an example, which is a highly level thing to see. So apologies if this confuses you. If you're at full employment, look at the purple part of the graph. I would say that in the long run, my current level of output is fixed. Right, that in the long run, my output isn't really gonna change from wherever I'm at because if I'm at full employment, I'm at the max, right? Well, assume that the velocity of money is also constant. It isn't always also, it isn't always constant, but assume a question tells you that, hey, the velocity of money is constant. So it's just staying locked into play too. So V and Y here ain't changing. And they tell you, hey, the Federal Reserve does an expansionary monetary policy, this thing in pink. They increase the money supply. What will happen in the long run? In the long run, Y is fixed. The velocity of money is constant. Oh, so when I increase M, all I'm going to get is an increase P. Oh, it's just this graph thing, but in formula. It's just a formula to show you the math. Now, they can ask you to do math problems with it. We'll look at one of the math problems they've asked before on the AP exam. But those are fairly simple formulas, to be honest. It's just M times V equals P times Y. So as long as you keep track of what this is, the if they ask you to do math, they're asking you to multiply these two things together and it'll get you what these two things are multiplied together, which shouldn't be that hard if you're in an AP class as a senior. You should be able to do a lot of numbers multiplied by each other. No calculator. So we'll see when we get to the question if that's the thing that you can actually handle. But that's a thing that the AP exam kind of expects you to be able to handle. All right. Now, let's go to the questions. <gasps> oh my God, that's fine. Uh, preview. And let's make this significantly more readable. I have mostly multiple choice questions in this because a lot of these things in this unit are either only found in multiple choice questions or if they're in an FRQ, are only one part of the FRQ. Outside of crowding out, which is the one FRQ I actually have and a full FRQ that is mostly about, uh, outside of crowding out, most of the things that you've learned in this review session are multiple choice heavy, or if they're in an FRQ, are just one part of an FRQ. So I don't wanna show like five FRQs and be like, okay, let's just skip to part D because it's not gonna make sense to do part D without doing part A through C. So mostly multiple choice on this uh, video. I've got to pull up my freaking pen again. I cannot remember to open this Epic Pen. This little app that I use for my drawing on my screen. Straight up could not remember to open it up there ever. Okay, cool. So if the government implements an expansionary fiscal policy, what action can the central bank take to maintain a stable interest rate? This is built around the idea that changing monetary and fiscal policy have different effects on interest rates. An expansionary fiscal policy based on crowding out gets me a higher interest rate. It doesn't actually tell me here that this government is in a deficit, but if you do an expansionary policy, you're gonna be engaging in deficit spending unless you're in a massive surplus. Because if you're doing an expansionary policy, your tax revenue is either going down or your government spending is going up. So no matter what, you're going to be doing like something that should be adding to your deficit, which means you should be getting a higher interest rate. If you wanted a stable interest rate, I know this is going to make it go up. So I would want the central bank to be lowering the interest rate. Right. I don't want to double up on increasing interest rate. I want a stable interest rate. So I want to like, I want to like cancel the idea. The idea is here to cancel it. So a lower interest rate for, for monetary policies happen also with expansionary. So I'm looking for whichever of these is an expansionary monetary policy. Now I'm gonna process of elimination some stuff real quick. It says, what can the central bank do? Uh, well, I do know a couple of things here. I, sh and, you sh and you should, know that the central bank does not control your income taxes. Congress does. The government does, the central bank does not. So. The fiscal policy action would have been this possibly, but this is not monetary. Central bank controls monetary, so those out of the way. Now I get to increase reserve ratio, sell government bonds, buy government bonds. Could process of eliminate from here and be like, well, increasing reserve requirement is contractionary, so is 
selling bonds, so it has to be buying bonds, which gets you the right answer. But again, let's follow the logic fully. We're trying to do an expansionary monetary policy. Increasing the required reserve ratio makes it harder for banks to lend because they have to hold on to more of your deposits. So that's contractionary. So that's a no-go. The government or central bank selling bonds to people means that people are buying bonds from the Fed, which means they have less money to spend. So that's contractionary as well. But when the Fed's buying bonds, that means that money is flowing back into the economy, like into the hands of people and banks, which means the money supply would be going up. Because technically it's this that is happening in the drawing that I did on my whiteboard. It's my, this is my really bad money market graph drawing. The Fed buying bonds is expansionary, gets me a lower interest rate. I know that the expansionary fiscal policy gets me a higher interest rate, and I need to do something to cancel that out. So again, this statement and this question is all built around the idea that doing an expansionary monetary policy gets you a lower interest rate. Doing an expansionary fiscal policy gets you a higher interest rate because of crowding out. So even though this question doesn't say the words crowding out in, it's technically a crowding out problem. Gotta love that. Two. A reduction in inflation can be best achieved by which of the following combinations of fiscal and monetary policy? Okay, so we got to look at the question. Does this question care about the interest rate thing? This says a reduction in inflation can be best achieved. So it's looking for me to reduce inflation. What type of policy reduces inflation? Contractionary, right? Because expansionary helps with recessions. Contractionary helps with inflationary gaps. So I'm looking for contractionary in both. I'm wanting to do contractionary in both because I'm wanting to reduce inflation. So I would need contractionary in both to be doing that. So I'm going to be looking, I'm going to do fiscal policy first because that's easier to understand. Those are easier to think about. Increased taxes is contractionary. That sounds good. Decreased taxes is expansionary. Nope. Decreased taxes is expansionary. Nope. Decreased government spending is contractionary. Yep. Increased government spending is, expa is expansionary. Nope. I would need a contractionary policy for both because I needed to reduce inflation. These three don't reduce inflation. Lowering taxes means people can spend more. That causes more spending. That's not helpful here. Now I've got to go between A and D and figure out which of those monetary policies is expansionary. I just mentioned the bond thing that the Fed selling bonds is contractionary. So if the Fed is selling bonds. That means we're buying them. We're giving the Fed a bunch of money. So we have less to spend which would reduce inflation, because if you want inflation to go down, you want spending to go down. So A would work. A lower discount rate means that it's cheaper to borrow from the Fed, so banks could borrow more. That's expansionary. Eh, can't have that. That's why it's A. Cool. Number three. Quantity theory of money problem. An actual math problem. Insane they would do this to me. Throws me off every time I see it. Real output, nine grand. Price level, two. Velocity of money, three. Fine. Money supply is what? All right. M times V equals P times Q. So I, I'm always used to write, I'm used to writing it as Q. It's technically written as capital Y now. I wrote, just wrote it as, as a capital Q. Apologies. Money supply. Solve them for that. Times my velocity of money, three, equals price level, two, times real output, $9,000. It's terribly low for real output, but fine. So three times M equals two times nine is 18, and it's technically 18,000. I'm not going to write K here because I might get confused about like variables and stuff. I then divide both sides by three. And 18 divided by three, that's six thousand. Boop. That's why knowing how to do that formula is very easy. You just have to know your formulas for econ because a lot of the times the math problems themselves are not terribly difficult math problems. Two times 9,000, you should be able to do that without a calculator. You're just putting a bunch of zeros at the end of 18. It ain't that complicated. Four. Okay. In the long run. Great. 
A decrease in the money supply will affect price level and output in which of the following ways. This is tied to that monetary growth bit. I'm gonna draw it on my whiteboard because I need more space. So if I'm doing a decrease in the money supply, that is a contractionary monetary policy. Okay, I'm looking on my aggregate demand, aggregate supply graph because they said in the long run. It didn't say that I was starting at full employment, which is actually important. I don't know why they didn't tell you that, they should. Things get different if you're not starting at full employment, but I guess you're assuming you are if they don't tell you. Uh, don't love that to be honest. They could have worded that better. But maybe it throws you off to see more words on a question. I don't know. So we're starting off at full employment. They do a decrease in the money supply. Remember, that's a different graph. Money supply is going down, so interest rates go up. So aggregate demand goes down. If we decrease the money supply, then less spending will happen because less money is like in our economy, is the basic idea. So this is my short run change. I got myself a decrease in aggregate demand. I can't stop there though. The friggin' question asks the thing I hate to see in a question like this. You absolutely just hate to see it in the long run. And you're like, God, why? Okay, in the long run. All right, uh, doesn't say the government's involved. So I guess I'm assuming that they're not. Again, thank you AP exam questioner for being vague, but fine. Cool, if the government's not involved, that means aggregate supply is gonna move to get me back. Because of the long run self adjustment, that'd be my green thing here. There we go. Got myself an increase in my aggregate supply curve to get back to that full employment level of output. And looky there, my price level went down more. This is the monetary growth thing the idea that in the long run, a change in the money supply doesn't actually change output. So, one, you should have immediately gone down to, if you wrote down the thing I said there, if you chose not to write it, hilarious, stop doing that, write things that I say, I'm teaching you. Uh, you should go to output not changing because it says in the long run in the long run you always go back to full employment so your output's not really going to change and they decrease the money supply which would mean that prices would be going down less money is available money is becoming more scarce so prices would start to fall sorry archer is again begging for attention what a baby okay you're a 10 year old man, aren't you? Actually, no, you're nine years old. Still old, okay? All right. Number five. You love to see something like this. You're just like, oh God, three things. In the short run, how would a government's budget deficit, national debt, and real output change if government spending increases with no change in taxes? Oh, this is easy. The government's spending more, but it's not taxing more. Let's go from the right to left, actually. Real output should do what? In the short run, government's spending more than GDP should be going up. I mean, that's what real output is. So it ain't A, it ain't E. Excuse me. So we got increase in real output is the answer at the end of it. The government is increasing government spending with no change in taxes. So the government would be borrowing more, right? Because if they're spending more and not taxing any more than before, how the hell are they paying for stuff? Oh, they're borrowing. So the debt should probably increase. Oh, look, B and D are gone if the answer is C. Now, if you go left to right, that's also fine because the answer should still follow the same way. If you are increasing spending without increasing taxes, you are literally definition doing deficit spending. That is what deficit spending is. It's spending more when you don't have the money to cover it. So they're gonna have to borrow. The deficit is growing. And if the deficit's growing, then your debt's getting bigger. The debt is getting bigger. Archer, stop licking. Oh my God, he's licking my hand like crazy. <sighs> it's gross, his breath is terrible. Okay, but the deficit's growing, so the debt would be increasing if the deficit's growing. So I don't know why B even exists as an answer because that doesn't make any sense. And if the deficit and debt are increasing, that doesn't mean your real output's going down. The real output's going up because I've increased government spending. That should increase my output in the short run. In general, that should increase my output because there's an increase in government spending, but it would also increase the deficit and the debt because they're borrowing more to finance that spending. 
Okay, same topic. Country X has a budget deficit. Bummer. Means that their government spending is less than their tax revenue. Which of the following changes in government budget outlays? What the hell is its government spending? It's just how much money they set aside for the budget. It's how much money they lay out, outlay, lay out for the budget. Oh. Which of the following changes in budget outlays and tax revenue will result in a decrease in their budget deficit? This is always weird to, to hear because you're like, wait, the deficit is decreasing. Does that mean that it's like that we're more negative or more positive? The deficit decreasing means that this gap is getting closer. That we're moving away from this and more towards this. We're trying to get that to happen. So if they're trying to get that to happen, what they will have to do, which will reduce the deficit, will be to have tax revenue exceed government spending. You want to eat into the deficit. You want to try and fix the deficit. You're going to need to be taxing more than you're spending. So I'm looking through the answer choices now. I've got government spending fall by 100 million. Okay, that's good. It's good to have the government spending go down. That'll help. And tax revenue is falling by 600. Not helpful. I need more tax revenue. Government outlays fall by 200. Also like that. Tax revenue also fall by 200. Don't like that. Stop doing that. Government outlays raise by 300 million. That's already not great. Tax revenues fall by 300 million. That's not good. Government outlays raise by 400 million. I don't like that, but wait. Tax revenues raised by 600 million. The tax revenue exceeds the government spending. So even though government spending did go up, the tax revenue was higher. D works. And this one, I raise and I raise. I get equal in both. That's not helpful. I need to have tax revenue exceed government spending. It'd be much better if government spending went down and tax revenue went up. But none of those answer choices say that, right? If this was fall, if this was uh, fall by 100 and raised by 600, this would be better. It's going to have the most positive impact. But D is the answer because out of all of these, D is the only one that would be a surplus. Because the way to counteract the deficit is to try and cause a surplus. Okay, delete and seven. An increase in government spending financed by increased borrowing will likely change the real interest rate and gross private domestic investment. God, that's a long way to say investment spending. Which of the following ways? This is crowding out, gang. By now, you got to know what crowding out's doing. If the government is borrowing more than on my market for loans, which is where real interest rate is. That's why it's helpful to know what your graphs are. If the government is borrowing more, there's an increased demand for loanable funds. Okay, that gets me a higher real interest rate. All right, I've narrowed it down to two choices now. And if interest rates go up, investment spending should go down. Because if invest interest rates are going up, that means borrowing gets more expensive. So you can't borrow and spend as much. So investment spending drops. That's just, the, this is why crowding out's bad. Okay, number eight. Country A's growth rate in real per capita, oh sorry, in per capita real GDP has been consistently higher than that of country B. Just means that their growth rate's better, right? Their, their economy is growing consistently higher. And it says that they have uh, per capita, so it's not just like that they've got more people. Which of the following factors can account for these differences in per capita GDP growth rate? Uh, country B's gives more investment tax credits. Investment tax credits would make investment spending more likely that would make country B better and this time the country A is higher than B so that doesn't make sense uh, B the labor force of country A is becoming more skilled than the labor force of country B if I'm thinking of what causes growth I'm thinking of capital and uh, investment spending well this would improve country A's human capital so works but let's see if anything else works the natural rate of unemployment is higher in country A that's not good that would mean that their like full employment level is lower because they have like a higher level of 
unemployment that they should have. That's not helpful. Country A's central bank is less effective at controlling the inflation rate. That's just not good. The, I'm not, that, that kind of applies here, but it's certainly not a good thing. And then E, although the populations are the same, country A has twice as many people who are retired. How would that help them have more growth? No, it's B. B is the only one that even kind of makes sense. I mean, A might trick you if you're like, oh, investment spending, that's good. It's like country B is getting the investment tax credits, which means they're getting like a tax cut for doing investment spending. Uh, yeah, that'd be great, except for the fact that country A is doing better than B, so that shouldn't be happening. Number nine, government investment in human capital, got it, is likely to do what? Well, let's look at this. Oh, man, there's a lot of graph stuff happening here. Well, government investment is government spending, right? And human capital is human capital. If I'm looking at my aggregate demand supply curve stuff, I'm looking at the thing that I drew that I told you you don't need to draw. Because government spending is an increase in G, which is a thing that changes aggregate demand, right? That would increase AD. Human capital affects your ability to produce things, which is an aggregate supply thing. In fact, technically, this kind of thing would affect both short and long run, because it affects your ability to produce right now, and it would affect your ability to produce long term, because it's not like they get smarter and then they magically like lose that intelligence. So you get higher aggregate demand and higher aggregate supply. These both work. This statement sounds right. It's weird that it's differentiating between short run and long run here. They're kind of both happening both of the time. But if they're saying this to mean that like the long run aggregate supply is shifting to the right, that is also accurate. Aggregate demand shifts left. No, they increase government investment. So that should increase aggregate demand. Government shifts to the right and the long run Phillips curve shifts to the right. Weird. But if my long run Phillips curve shifted to the right, that actually wouldn't be good because this is unemployment rate. So having like my ideal level of unemployment, which is what the LRPC represents. Oh, you can't see my face in the way. But on my Phillips curve, like unemployment rates by x-axis, I would not want a higher unemployment rate where LRPC is at. I would want it to be lower. So this doesn't work. Aggregate shifts to the left in the long run. What the hell? Uh, no. Aggregate shifts to the left in the sh stop. Stop telling me AD shifts left. No, they increase government investment. There's more government spending. It said the word investment and the word government. Both of those improve aggregate demand. And I guess you could assume they're investing more because their human capital is going up. So they should be investing more. Okay, last multiple choice question. Sorry, there's a whole bunch of them. This is the last one. Look at all these things you have to keep track of. Which of the following combinations of changes in income taxes, real interest rate, and investment spending is likely to promote economic growth? Which of these is the best? It's, this question is as easy as it seems. It's asking for which of these is going to get you the most growth over time. I need as much spending. I need as much production as possible. I need a bunch of stuff. I would want to tax people less because they'll spend more. I would want interest rates to be low, which those two are both accurate there. Because if the interest rates are low, then the investment spending should be high. Thank you, E. That's it. The most important thing here for economic growth is to get higher investment spending. So you should have eliminated, frankly, B, C, and D instantaneously. Uh, you literally can't have higher investment if you have higher interest rates. So that would have gotten rid of A. So even if you weren't sure about what you should do to taxes, because maybe you got stuck on like, well, what about crowding out? If you got stuck there, uh, the last two kind of help give it away because investment is the most important thing here. You need it to be going up. Only two of them say that. And the other one undoes it saying that with the interest rate thing. Remember, interest rates and investment spending, inverse relationship. Very important to know. Okay, last thing, the FRQ, and then we're done. How are we doing on time? 10 minutes is plenty of time to do this graph. Loanable funds market's currently in equilibrium. Got it, here we go. Draw a little graph of loanable funds market. Can do, thank you very much. Easy thing to do, Mr. FRQ. You can absolutely do that.
label your equilibrium interest rate as R star and QF star. Okay. Like that. Weird they last you label like that, but you know, they told me to do it, so I'm gonna do it. Assume the country the government of country X, which had a balanced budget, now increases its spending while holding taxes constant. Assume that the government spending that they'll increase government spending with increased borrowing. Okay, now this is a good time to mention that there are technically two ways to show crowding out, because this question would have had two possible ways you can answer it. The way I've been drawing it and the way that I would draw it is an increase in demand. So on B2, I would draw an increase in my demand curve. Like that's my drawing for, well, there we go, B2. For B1, what is the impact on the budget balance? They're asking, is this budget moving towards a deficit, a surplus, or is it balanced? Well, it was balanced and the government's spending more and not taxing any more than before. So they're borrowing, so deficit. So for two, we got here a nice little deficit. Any of my seconds, Mr. Kids would, re would realize watching me do this FRQ that this is the FRQ I used on the crowding out practice that they had to do last week. Then on your graph and part A, show that effect. Yeah, there you go. There's my drawing. You could also draw this as a decrease in the supply of loanable funds. If you're watching this and you have a different teacher and they said crowding out decreases the supply of loanable funds, that is allowed. That is not an incorrect thing because technically speaking, you could think of it as there is now less money to give out to everybody else. So there is a lower supply of funds available to the public. Kind of depends on how you're taught slash learn how to view this graph. Is it the loans for everyone in the economy or are you just talking about loans that people can get? Kind of affects if you're gonna move the supplier demand curve. But an increase in demand or a decrease in supply would both get you the important thing here which is going to matter for this, my real interest rate goes up when this happens. Given your answer in part B2, this thing, which they didn't ask about, but I'm, I'm going to need it. Uh, what will happen to private sector investment sensitive expenditures? This word means spending. This word means spending that is tied to interest rates. This word means by people. So people spending that's tied to interest rates. What kind of stuff do people spend that's tied to interest rates? Cars, homes, stuff like that. They're talking about investment spending. They're just talking about one part of investment spending. Okay, uh, let it go down. Why interest rates higher? If interest rates are higher, that means loans are more expensive. Like buying a car, buying a house is harder. No, thank you. It goes down. And then given your answer in part C, what will be the impact on the long run growth rate of the economy? Again, that is investment spending. Investment spending is going down. So what should happen to my long run growth rate? It should drop. see a decrease in growth because if you have less investment spending you're going to have to, a lower accumulation of capital businesses won't be able to buy as many factories as many tools technology machinery hire as many people whatever because they can't borrow like even if you think like businesses don't get debt that often they do you're wrong but even if you didn't think that making it harder for them even just theoretically is worse making it harder for them in practice, which is what is actually happening, is also significantly worse. Like you are making it worse for businesses by having a higher real interest rate. They won't be able to borrow and spend as much. That is not helpful. So your economic growth rate gets hurt. And that's the FRQ. There are little bits of FRQs that are tied to the other parts of the unit, but again, I can't really pull one of those and not answer the entire FRQ for it to make sense because it's usually like a part D or part E thing that they're throwing in from this unit. And that would take quite a while and we're already at 525 so we're doing just fine finishing where we're at if you need extra help or extra clarification on any of the things i said today there's a bunch of random stuff i mean crowding out's tricky quantity of money tricky equation of exchange tricky why fiscal policy gets you higher interest rates but monetary policy gets you lower interest rates when they're both expansionary that's weird it's tricky feel free to leave stuff in the comments if you need extra clarification feel free to go back to the video because i did explain all that stuff i just talk super freaking fast so there's a good chance you like looked at your phone for two seconds and then lost the entire explanation of how the quantity theory of money works. It just happens. So if you got a question, feel free to leave it in the comments. I will do my best to respond to it. 
Uh, we are getting close to the AP exam. Next week, we are covering Unit 6. That is international trade. That is balance of payments accounts. That is foreign exchange market. That's really it, because a lot of the stuff is built off of the foreign exchange market, of like foreign exchange market and how it gets your currency value to change, currency value change and how it affects net exports, how that affects capital flow. Oh my God, lots of stuff there. That all is next week. Consult the calendar if you want to know what's happening on which day. I believe it's international trade and balance of payments is Tuesday. And then Forex market and capital flow is Thursday of next week. And then we get to AP exam week, y'all, after that. Yeah, we're getting close. Oh my God, Archer, please stop. Stop it. Just stop it. Actually, fine. Get the bone. Get the bone. Get the bone. Good boy. Yep. Give it. Cute. Check. Oh, I think that kind of hurt. On the corner. But he got it. You can see him on the couch just fling himself at it full speed. Archer, come here. Come here back. Yeah, you can feel the anger. This is this is what it's like to play with him. It's just anger and fury and flinging this bone around and staring at me until I do it. I'm just going to not acknowledge him right now and you can watch him react poorly. Come here. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. He brought it even closer. Very nice. One more time. Hwah! Oh, that hit him in the butt. All right. That should be it for today. There's your nice little view of Archer at the end. Uh, if you need anything, feel free to let me go know, guys. Thank you all for watching, as always. Greatly appreciate it. I hope you all have a great rest of your day and wish you best of luck in prepping for your AP exams. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one.